Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today I'm continuing the study of the book of John. Now, if you have not watched the previous episodes, please go back and watch this from the beginning. All of the videos are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Today I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, uh, chapter 16, beginning with verse 16. Now, I'm a KJV firstist, which means uh, I look at it first in the KJV. Many times that's sufficient, but often I like to look at it also in the Amplified translation. The Amplified is, is like a translation and a commentary mixed together. Sometimes I find it to be helpful. So uh, let, let's begin. Chapter 16, verse 16. A little while, and ye shall not see me again. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Well, it's not unusual that uh, his apostles and all of the disciples, uh, in fact, audience in general, oftentimes they don't understand what he's saying. And many times he's told them, he says, why are you so... Uh, dull of mind, you, know, you don't understand this. It's, this is spiritual language I'm speaking in. And in this case, you know, he is talking about his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and uh, that's what he's alluding to there. And he has mentioned this already, but they just seem to forget, and, and, and maybe they just ignore it because they don't want to accept it. Or I, for a number of different reasons, they're just not getting it, though. Uh, so let me read these verses here also in the Amplified and see how it states it. Um, and this, the Amplified also has uh, subtitles. And the subtitle before uh, verse 16 is, Jesus' death and resurrection foretold. Now, this is not the first time that his uh, death, burial, and resurrection is foretold. He's, he's already mentioned it before, but again, he foretells it. Verse 16 in the Amplified, A little while, and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean when he tells us, A, a little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, and you will see me and because I am going to my Father. So they were saying, what does he mean when he says, a little while? Uh, we do not know what he's talking about. Well, nothing really great uh, of great help there in the Amplified Translation. Uh, but of course, when he says, in a little while you will not see me, uh, that is, uh, he will be uh, in the tomb. And then they will see him. That's the resurrection. Uh, so let me now continue in the KJV. Verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. So, again, he's talking about, I mean, he, 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 he oftentimes reads people's minds, and uh, they're talking, I don't think this is, uh, in a case where he just overhears them. Maybe it is. But oftentimes, 
uh, he, he is not in a position to, to hear, but he knows what they're talking about. He knows what they're thinking. And so he, he's saying, you don't understand. Do you, maybe I should ex explain this to you. Um, but it, so he explains it not really uh, exactly uh, and the death, burial, and resurrection. But what he says is, uh, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament. Of course, that's that's because of his death. Uh, and, and when he was uh, taken, uh, then put on trial, and, and then uh, put on trial again, first on trial by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious leaders, and then taken to the governor, Paul, Roman governor Pontius Pilate and tried again and finally sentenced to death. Um, so when he, when he was taken though, everybody fled. They were cowards. This is one of the great evidences uh, that, that tells me and many people have been convinced that uh, the, the cowardice of the apostles uh, fleeing and hiding uh, because they were afraid for their lives. Um, all of them, except for Judas who killed himself and John, who was the only apostle that stayed with him. He was there uh, outside, right outside while the trial was going on. He was there at the cross with uh, the two Marys. Uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus. John was there, but all the others were hiding, afraid for their lives. And, and yet, a few days later, they, they change, there's a change from cowardice to the most bold, courageous <clears throat> witnesses for Jesus, uh, knowing that uh, if they publicly um, identified that they were his apostles and disciples. And now they witnessed his resurrection and they start proclaiming it publicly. They knew that that would eventually would be a death sentence for them too. And yet they did it. And it's because of the resurrection. The resurrection is what turned them from cowards into bold witnesses and martyrs. And they, they would not be willing to, um, to, testify of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection um, at the cost of their lives for a lie, for a conspiracy. If they, um, and not one of them at any point under the torture and a martyr's death, not one of them recanted. It, it, the argument is that if, if it was a, a fabrication and uh, they, they were making it up and there was no resurrection. In fact, not just the apostles and all the disciples, but there were over 500 eyewitnesses to, to Jesus' resurrection. And um, so, so this is much broader than just the apostles. But the apostles died for their testimony. And we can argue that why would someone be willing to suffer and die for something if they knew that it was a lie? Now, if they believed something and it wasn't true, but they actually believed it, you can see how a person would be willing to die for something they really believed in, even if it turns out that it was false. But in this case, uh, they were willing to die for it, uh, for something that they knew to be true because they were eyewitnesses. Um, so I've gotten a little bit... Uh, off track from this. This hasn't really gone to great detail about the uh, resurrection, death, burial, and resurrection period, but this is a forecast of it. Jesus is foretelling it. So let's look at, um, uh, it, but he does say at the end of verse 20, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And that's the resurrection that turned their sorrow into joy. Verse 21 in the KJV says, a woman when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. Um, 
So he's comparing his their sorrow that they have, the the the, uh, the grief over his death, being replaced by joy, comparing it to what happens as the woman is suffering, she's in anguish, uh, but once the child is born, she. She remembers the anguish, suffering no more, because she's so full of joy over the birth. And that's what happens. That's what Jesus is saying about them. He says, you'll be sorrowful, you'll be in anguish, but you won't even remember that sorrow. Once the res there's a resurrection, you'll be so full of joy. Let's look at verse 20, uh, 23. No. Uh, verse 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now this is the third time that I can recall this statement being made. And it's very important for people to understand that we must not take this verse out of context and teach it that uh, any believer today who asks in prayer, ask something of Jesus, uh, ask something to be, a prayer to be answered in the name of Jesus, and then that God is obligated to give you everything. I mean, just think about that. Uh, is every believer's, Every prayer answered, and you, do you always get a healing? Do you always get the financial, uh, you know, an, answer of a financial need? Do you always get your prayer answered exactly the way you want it to? My prayers haven't always been answered that way. Have yours? If you if you say that that's the case, then I, I have to challenge your sincerity. Um, so. Uh, people are, are, today are taking this verse, and as I said, it's, it, the same thing is stated twice earlier, and they're they're teaching it that it, you, you, whatever you ask God in Jesus' name is going to be given to you, and if it's not given to you, then the blame is on you because you didn't have enough faith, or there's some sin in your life. Uh, so. And it, that's it's a false teaching that causes horrible anguish from people when their prayers are not answered. The correct way of understanding this verse in the context now and in the previous examples is that Jesus was telling his apostles and disciples that when you do this ministry works at this particular time in history, you will be given the power to do miraculous things. And you'll ask God to do something for you that is uh, is supernatural, and he'll do it. Because in the very beginnings of the church, right after Jesus' ascension, the apostles had to produce signs and wonders to get people's attention and to convince them that the, the power of God was, was working through them. Now let's look at verse 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Verse 26. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I shall, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from the Father. The saying come out from the Father is one of the things that uh, in the early Christian creeds that uh, in their attempt to explain the Godhead, um, they, uh, they take this phrase here and, and, uh, as, as a means of explaining that, that um, there's one God the Father's God, the Son's God, the Holy Spirit's God, and Jesus came out of the Father. Uh, he is completely God. He's the same substance and essence of God. Um, the, uh, I have a playlist titled Early 
Christian creeds. And so I hope you will watch that. It's, a, it's very interesting. And there's a lot of good things in those creeds, but there's also uh, grave uh, omission and, and um, error in these creeds regarding salvation. But in terms of explaining the Godhead, uh, the creeds have done an excellent job. Um, verse 28. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. So as he came from forth from the Father, he came down from heaven and am come into the world as uh, uh, God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, and then he says, uh, uh, again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So that is talking about the fact that he will, um, the death, burial, and resurrection, and then for 40 days he walks among them, but then he will leave again. And that's the ascension when, and at that time he left and he hasn't returned. Uh, he's, he's been, the Bible says, at the right hand of the Father and he's preparing a place for us, for all of us who put our faith in Jesus. Um, so uh, I leave the world and go to the Father. Verse 29, his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. He didn't come forth from God like he sent, like a messenger, like an angel. The word angel means messenger. So he, he didn't come forth like from God like just a prophet or an angel. Uh, he came forth from God in that he, the God, the substance and essence of God, and that's what he is. And he came forth from him and was manifest in the flesh as a man. Verse 31, Jesus answered them, do ye now believe? Verse 32, behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So he's, again, uh, foretelling, he's prophesying about that they will be scattered, that they will all desert him and abandon him at the uh, his hour of trouble once he's arrested. Verse 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye have, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So a lot of times people teach that, you know, for salvation we have to overcome. Uh, but the Bible says that we are in Christ, and Christ has overcome the world. So we are overcomers in the fact that we are in Christ. An overcomer is someone who has put their faith in Christ. By doing that, we've overcome the uh, sin, the condemnation. Uh, all right, that's the end of chapter 16. I'll uh, pick up with chapter 17 uh, next time. Uh, let me make take a moment here to explain the gospel. If you haven't heard it, make it very simple and plain. Uh, Jesus said, um, my my uh, yoke is easy and my burden is light. But the, the yoke is a picture of, of, of being connected to Jesus, being in Christ, by Christ being in you, our spirit be connected to the Holy Spirit. So uh, this is the yoke, the connection to God. Uh, uh, and that's easy. All that's required of you to be yoked to God to, uh, to be born again as a child of God is to reject uh, all of the religions of the world and all the people of the world as the answer for your salvation. Reject that and instead put your faith completely in a, one person, Jesus Christ, eternal God Almighty, 
manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, who died for our sins, who is the only Savior, the sole source of life everlasting. Put your faith in him and put your faith in what he's done for you. He died for your sins. Your sin problem between you and God is resolved because Jesus paid for your sins. So um, it's easy. You just trust Jesus completely. And the burden is light, he says, because once you're born again, um, there, there's no religious burden put on you where you've got to uh, join religions, follow a set of religious rules, become a very religious person. That's not required. He says, just believe in him and the Holy Spirit will transform you. And from that moment on, love God and love each other. Now, how well we succeed at loving each other is, is uh, varies. Some people, you know, they, they end up being much more loving than others. But uh, how well we succeed at loving uh, is not a, de a determining factor for our salvation. It's something we're told that we should do. Now, now that you've put your faith in Jesus, now will you just um, uh, understand that God has a plan for your life. He has, uh, you're a child of God, you're part of the family of God now. So now, study the Bible, pray and, and, and communicate with God, have this relationship with Jesus Christ, have fellowship with your with other believers, and and uh, and then ask God, what is it you want me to do? You have a plan for my life, and once you get an answer, then get busy doing it. Uh, now, why should you believe all this? Why should you put your faith in Jesus? Why should you trust that this is true? It's the resurrection. The resurrection is what changed the apostles from cowards to bold martyrs. Uh, the resurrection is what gives us confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. He said he would prove his claims were true by raising himself from the dead. And he did. Uh, at the, once he was raised from the dead bodily, he actually walked among uh, 500 witnesses for 40 days. They saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. And that resurrection proves to us that he is God, he is the Savior, he is the sole source of life everlasting. And he promises you, if you put your faith in him, he guarantees you, you're going to have eternal life in heaven. It's a guarantee. So you don't have to worry the rest of your life whether you're, you know, God's going to accept you. It's a promise from Jesus Christ, so you can trust it. Put your faith in Jesus now. Join the family of God and enjoy this promise, this blessed assurance that you, you do have eternal life in the kingdom of God assured to you. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.